What's cracking, people? This is the Black Trekker. Thank you for taking time out your morning, afternoon, or evening to sit in with me for a few ticks so I can talk to you about another wonderful episode of the Star Trek universe. You already know, like they just said, resistance is futile. If you're looking for any other channel to sit in for a few moments to learn about the wonderful history of Trek. Now, I'm going to break down to you from my perspective, and I would definitely appreciate it if you leave in the comment section your thoughts on what occurred in this particular episode. This episode starts in Season 5, Episode 15 of Star Trek Voyager. Then just give you a breakdown, a quick rundown, or rather, of what is occurring with the Starship Voyager. Voyager is in an unremarkable part of space, but they're there for a reason. It's all orchestrated. Catherine Janeway has a, an idea up her sleeve. And what she wants to do is she wants to get the Borg finally and take something from them. So what happens is, is that the Starship Voyager is accosted by a Borg probe. Now, Borg probes are significantly smaller than the staple ships of the Borg fleet, which we all know are like the Borg Cube and also the Borg Sphere. Significantly smaller. To give you an idea, a Borg Cube is three kilometers in diameter and width. And what that basically breaks down to about 3,000 meters. So 3,000 meters in width, 3,000 meters in height, 3,000 meters in length. The ship is absolutely ginormous, gigantic, huge. Then you also have the Borg Sphere. Borg Sphere is 600 meters in diameter and width and length. So with that being said, it's also huge. Uh, it's equivalent to probably like a sovereign class starship. Now you have the probe. The probe is about 360 meters in length, 100 meters in height. So with that being said, it's significantly smaller. It's on par with the Starship Voyager because Starship Voyager is 343 meters in length basically 100 meters in width so it's equivalent in size and also the firepower is on par so with that being said it's kind of like an even fight but nonetheless the borg have detected voyager they detected relevant technology because voyager has warp drive and they're like okay let's go and assimilate them now upon coming into contact with voyager they make the assumption that it's going to be an easy fight but this is what it said Right there. You pursue us, we're going to open fire. So the Borg, naturally, they go with the same rational that we're superior, we're the Borg, your weapon systems are irrelevant, and naturally, they're going to get they, they butt handed to them. So what happens is that, and being in the military, and I've always stated this about Star Trek Voyager, Star Trek in general, they are a military. You have to have a strategic planning when dealing with an adversary or an enemy. And that's essentially what occurred. What happened was is that the Borg opened fire on the um, Star Trek uh, Voyager. And what happened was is that Voyager was able to brunt the majority of the hits. And then they returned fire with their phasers. But Harry Kim, ingenious idea, beamed a photon torpedo over to the Borg ship. The Borg didn't have time to adapt. The photon torpedo exploded. Boom. And it destroyed a significant portion of of the Borg ship, like 95%, which that's not recoverable for them. Even though the Borg have the ability to regenerate, that's not something that can make him recover because as it was stated in um, the episode in Star Trek Next Generation, they can repair up to 80% damage of the ship. So with that being said, yeah, they can't come back from that. So basically what occurred was that Captain Janeway and the crew of the Voyager salvaged a lot of wreckage from this Borg ship around eight tons but what they discovered was is that they were looking for a transwarp coil and why is a transwarp coil relevant because it allows Borg vessels to travel at transwarp speeds which is significantly faster than warp which is significantly faster than warp drive to give you an idea it'll be like equivalent to me riding in a car and someone riding in a fighter jet significantly faster so that's why it's a sought after piece of technology like let's say if you were going from washington dc and you were trying to go to texas if you're in a car you're limited by fuel and also by speed but if you're in a jet it's constant and so that's the difference transwarp is a significantly better form of travel so 
and the Borg have this ability which allows them to be able to travel to all four quadrants of the galaxy, Alpha, Beta, and Delta, and uh, uh, Gamma Quadrant. So they're able to travel to all four quadrants. Now, this is the thing. They destroyed about 95% of the vessel, so it was not salvageable, the, the transwarp coil. But what they did discover, thanks to 7 and 9, was the ability of the Borg data nodes. And the Borg data nodes was able to show where Borg fleets were, where Borg uh, vessels were. And they were also be able to break down uh, the defense weaknesses that Borg ships have. So this was an invaluable piece of technology as well. But what happened was is Catherine Janeway, she had a, um, a meeting with the senior staff. And the senior staff is comprised of the leader of astrometrics, which would be seven to nine. It would also be the head of security, which would be Tuvok, tactical. Also, the, the lead helmsman, which would be Tom Paris, and also Commander Jacote. And then also the doctor. So what happens is, is that she's sitting down and she's talking to them. And she said, um, based off of the data nodes that were recovered, that there was a Borg vessel about three light years away. About three days in times of travel at maximum warp. And it was limping back home. It was only traveling at warp two. And this right there presented an opportunity because the transwarp coil was being repaired. And in, in three days, it would be fixed. Because the one thing about the Borg conscious system is the consciousness of the Borg is this. They stay in relatively good communication with each other. So although this ship was damaged, and it wasn't damaged because of a battle, it was damaged because of a plasma storm. Although Borg technology is extremely advanced and sophisticated, they are still susceptible to sometimes the moods of nature, which are plasma storms. And so this ship was damaged by that plasma storm. And they were making repairs, and the Borg that were on the vessel were communicating with the collective at large, saying, hey, it's going to take three days for us to repair our transwarp. In the meantime, we're just using conventional warp drive. And so the collective was like, okay, cool. The collective could send, they could have sent other ships to engage them and help them, but who's going to mess with the Borg in general? The Borg don't have any real natural threats. So it was limping back home at Warp 2. Catherine Janeway, the captain of the Voyager, saw this as an opportunity, and she was talking about this is Fort Knox. And nobody else in the room knew what Fort Knox was except for uh, Lieutenant Tom Paris. And that's because Tom Paris is a history buff of the 20th century and the 21st century. So he basically broke down what Fort Knox was and everybody else got the um, gist of what it meant. And she was like, we're going to steal a transwarp coil. Now, it was another part of this episode that was actually quite interesting. It revealed more information about um, Seven and Nine and also it revealed her real name. Her real name was Annika Hansen. Now, with that being said, Annika is a name that's indicative of someone that's from, like, the USSR, Russia, Kazakhstan, the Czech Republic, um, Ukraine. So she is from a descendant of that type of um, heritage. Now, with that being said, we know that her real name is not Seven of Nine. It's really Annika. But Seven of Nine, tertiary, adjunct, that's what... She prefers to be called because she was in a team and the team was nine Borg and she was seven of nine. So that's what they call her. But Captain Janeway, she calls her seven for short. But anyway, we learn who she really is. We learn about her family. Her family were um, xenobiologists. They studied different life forms and they also studied. They wanted to study the Borg and Starfleet had approved them to have their own ship. And what occurred was is they were able to finally follow a Borg cube. And they had in-depth research on Borg. I'm talking about they followed the cube for like three years. They had adaptive camouflage that masked their biosignatures where they could actually go on a Borg ship and they could actually study the Borg up close. When a, a Borg was in its um, regeneration chamber and they would regenerate for like 8 to 12 hours because even Borg needed sleep. They would take a Borg, beam it back onto their ship, the USS Raven, that's what it was called, because it was commissioned by Starfleet. The USS Raven, they would study that Borg, put a tag on that Borg, 
and beam him back to his alcove. And the alcove is just basically where they sleep. And he would beam him back there, and they would be able to monitor it. And they gave each Borg names. Now, of course, they didn't have the ability to give all the Borg's name because they were following the cube, and an average cube has 120,000 Borg on it. So they can't do that. But they gained a large insight on the Borg Collective. And unfortunately, the Hansons didn't quit while they were ahead. They let their time run out, and then eventually the Borg were able to detect them, and then they got assimilated. But that's later into the story. Essentially, this Borg cube was an opportunity. Because with conventional warp drive, it would take 60 years to be able to get back to Starfleet, whereas with a transwarp coil, they're able to get back in a matter of hours or days. So that was the mission. And in conjunction with the knowledge that was provided by Seven and Nine and her parents that were deceased, she was able to be able to complete that mission. But this was a bump in the road because the Borg Queen knew full well what Seven and Nine was going to do. Even though she's in control of billions of drones, trillions of different individuals, she knew that Seven and Nine was trying to plan something. So she reached out to Seven and Nine in her generation tube and was like, look, I already know what you're trying to do. I know you're trying to steal a transwarp coil. I'm not going to allow it. Your mission is going to fail. You have to come back home. And it opened up a different dynamic of the Borg Collective because we perceive it to be just drones. We perceive it to be just automatons that are controlled by the Queen. But in actuality, the Queen perceived Seven and Nine differently she uh equated seven to nine as being unique because she had a personality and the borg struggled greatly with trying to assimilate humanity now for all intents and purposes starfleet humanity in general has been a pain in the borgs behind because they don't understand how they're so easily able to resist being assimilated so with that being said they failed with Locutus, and Locutus of Borg was Captain John Luke Picard. They failed with him, and he was able to retain his humanity. So with that being said, the Borg now are like, okay, well, listen, let's let, let's let Seven and Nine retain her humanity. If we're able to do that, then she can give us an insight on humanity so that we can be able to assimilate them and increase the Borg and make the Borg better. Because... The Borg essentially believed that through assimilation, they gain perfection. And through perfection, they are a better species as whole. I have my opinions and thoughts on this, but that's what I would say. I think they're delusional. But at the same time, this is what their um, goal is. So Seven and Nine being hesitant, she understands the power and the scope of the Borg Queen. I mean, even on a sphere... Or even on a probe, there's at least a thousand Borg. So they're still greatly outnumbered. So when they get on the Borg cube, and then they realize that this is not the case, but when they get on the actual Borg probe, they're able to see that their simulations, because they go through the holodeck and they run trials, and they're trying to get it down to two minutes. But with the uh, technology that was provided by Seven and Nine's parents, they're able to stay on the ship a lot longer, like around five to seven minutes, so they can plant charges, which will disable their shield grid, but then also beam out the uh, transport coil. But upon them completing this, Seven and Nine refuses. Seven and Nine stays on the ship. And because of this, they don't have time to be able to negotiate or conversate or try to debate. So Captain Janeway, uh, Instant Kim, and Tuvok beam back to Voyager. And the Borg probe doesn't come closer. It disappears into transwarp. And then it takes Seven and Nine back to the Unicomplex. And the Unicomplex is a large structure where all the Borg are located in that particular part of the Delta Quadrant. The Delta Quadrant has like four or five Unicomplexes, but this is the main one. And it's composed of trillions of Borg. Thousands of Borg vessels. I mean, this is one place in the Delta Quadrant that you do not want to go. So, with that being said, you could have expected 
Catherine Janeway to be like, okay, we're going to adapt this transwarp coil to our ship. And with a fully functional transwarp coil, they could have been back in the Alpha Quadrant in a matter of days. I mean, like probably about three to four days, they probably would have been back in the Alpha Quadrant. But this showed a different quality of Catherine Janeway that I did not anticipate before. I said that she was insane. And I said her leadership qualities were not really up to par. That was a mistake. She showed great respect and reverence. And this is when I say Star Trek is teaching a lesson. And although a lot of people want to say that Star Trek is not a military, this about her behavior is indicative of some of the, mo some of the actual models of uh, military uh, organizations. Never leave a man behind. Never leave a fallen comrade. And seven of nine had been fallen. She was left behind. But Catherine Janeway and the crew of Voyager did not leave seven of nine behind. They took that transwarp coil. They implemented it into the Delta Flyer. They found out where that Borg ship was. And they flew to the Unicomplex. And they got seven of nine back. Now, that right there shows leadership that shows loyalty and above all that makes captain janeway a better leader in my opinion never leave a person behind in the episode seven and nine made the statement that voyager is her collective that means she perceives them as their as her family so this was an outstanding episode because it showed the leadership of captain janeway it showed the loyalty of the crew it showed the fact that 709 actually gives a crap about her crew. And it also shows the complexities of the Borg at large. I would encourage all of you guys to check out the episode. And by all means, like, share, and subscribe. But let me ask you this question. Based off of this, you got the transwarp coil. 709 was a Borg. You got 142 souls on your ship. With that transwarp coil you could get back to the Alpha Quadrant in a number of days. Would you have risked it? Would you have risked your crew for one person? Or would you have turned on that transwarp coil, gave the order to the chief engineer to get things moving and get out of that particular part of the quadrant? What would have been your thought process? I know for me, I respect what Captain Janeway did. But what is your thoughts? Anyway, thanks for uh, taking in with me for a few ticks and live long and prosper.